And then we look at the achieved concentration. So the achieved concentration is this safety check. So we know what concentration we intend to use, uh, we intend to put within the space, but what we need to know is what's the worst case scenario there from a human safety point of view. So that's actually based on the actual net volume, the maximum hazard temperature, and the agent quantity supplied. Now, I've just done the calculation that says 78 kilograms of Novec. That's fairly clear with the chemical agents. The tent, you'll round up from 77.9 to 78. But with the inert gases, because we tend to use standard filled cylinders, if you're needing 2.5 cylinders, you have to apply three cylinders. So there is actually more agent going into that one than, than just a rounding up figure. Or the rounding up is actually, you know, could be quite significant. Number and size of the uh, containers. So the number of containers for halocarbon, the, the quantities will depend on the agent quantity, the fill density and container size and the distance from the hazard. The halocarbon agents are not as tolerant to the cylinders being placed away from the hazard as the inert gas systems are. So you're tending to look for a storage location quite close to, to the hazard. For inert agents, the quantity, the quantity is based on the agent quantity required, the size of the container, and typically that could be a standard 80 litre container or a 140 litre container, and, and the pressure, 150 bar, 200 bar or 300 bar. We've moved in the UK now to almost exclusively 300 bar technology. When you look at the footprint, the footprint of a 300 bar system is half that of a 150 bar system, which is why people would tend to, tend to favour a 300 bar system. And with the inert gases as a category, the distance from the hazard is, is less relevant. So you can look for locations of storage away uh, from the protected area and still design a viable system. You need to know the pipe runs and the nozzle positioning. So what's important? Well, the, the importance there is what the maximum area coverage is of the discharge nozzle and whether you're able to or want to apply a 180 or 360 degree pattern nozzle. We then need to look at the maximum coverage height for the nozzle, so whenever you see any listings for discharge nozzles, there is a vast array of tests that have been conducted to determine what the maximum area coverage is for the nozzle, what the maximum height is, and in some cases the maximum, maximum agent that can be discharged from that particular nozzle. So different nozzle sizes are available and there's maximum agent quantities per nozzle. Just to give you an illustration of how you may apply this is that if you get to a situation where the height that you're protecting is actually higher than the limitation of your discharge nozzle, you may need or choose to actually put two levels of nozzle. And this, this diagram just basically shows a situation where we, we have a, a nozzle there positioned at the maximum height if that height is exceeded, that maximum height, you may need to put a discharge nozzle halfway up or at some other uh, location within the space. Very important, and this is often overlooked, is that we, we know what the area of coverage is and people make claims about the coverage of a nozzle, saying, well, my nozzle covers 100 square metres. It may well cover 100 square metres in the test room and the way that it was applied in the ideal conditions. The reality is that we never actually come across those ideal conditions very often. So you may need to look at obstructions, in particular uh, compartmentation that's caused by cabinets. It may well be that the odd shape of the room means that whilst the overall uh, area of the space is within the area coverage limitations, you're not actually going to be able to get a proper mixing of the gas throughout the space because of the shape of that particular hazard. Ceiling obstructions are a common downfall of an adequate design of system. Uh, we tend to look into the floor void because it's fairly easy to do. We look into the room because we see cabinets, we know what we're looking at. But when you get above the false ceiling, it can be quite difficult to actually see all the obstructions that you may find there. Deep beams is one, uh, air conditioning, ductwork is a very, very common cause of uh, misapplication of the positioning of discharge nozzles. I say there that if the, if the depth of the ceiling void is sufficient and the, and the beams are no more than about 300 millimetres, then it may be acceptable to uh, position a nozzle just within uh, that overall general space. However, if that is not the case, where the uh, configuration is more complicated um, on the, and the beams are deeper than 300 millimetres, you may typically need many more nozzles and nozzles in each of those theoretical compartmentation uh, zones. 
when we then move on to the uh, onto the discharge nozzles we once we've positioned the discharge nozzles we need to connect them up with pipe work and one of the key rules when we're talking about the design of a system is that you need to take a, a look at the differences between the halocarbon agents and the inert gases. Without going into all the technicalities of the two agents, the inert gases is effectively a single component gas. So when you flow that through a pipework system, it actually doesn't care about the uh, differences in the, in the way that the pipework is organised. However, when you come to a halocarbon agent, and, and to make the point on this one, the, the halocarbon agents are typically two-phase flow agents. So you've got a, a dense liquid and vapour and nitrogen flowing through the pipework system. That gas tends to know what happens when it comes to a T. So when they get to a T, what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that the outlets from those T are treated equally. And the only way that you can adequately do that is to ensure that the outlets from the T's are all in the horizontal plane. So they're all in the same the same plane and if you take the example of a, a bullhead T uh, situation there we've got the flow of the agent going towards the bullhead T and the two outlets for that T are in the horizontal plane that is actually um, the correct way to do it and it is actually going to ensure that you get a predictable split of flow when the gas or the, the agent gets to that T point. An incorrect method of, deter of, of configuring that T is where you would put the outlets of that T in different vertical planes. And what the danger is there is that you will get the dense liquid actually flowing down the side outlet of the T and the less dense vapour gas actually going up the, the other way. And what would happen, because that vapour is very low in, in actual uh, extinguishing impact, you would get an over-concentrated zone down the way and an under concentrated zone going up the way. So the system designer really does need to take account of that. The more sophisticated flow calculation programs like those that uh, we use at Tyco actually don't allow the designer to configure uh, a system where the T's are in the wrong, uh, the wrong plane.